Okay, go on, Hazim. I am with you, we're live. Welcome to the innovation session at the uh, Society of Cardiothoracic Surgery. I am on a, honestly very thrilled that this is uh, taking almost a, a prime time, just, just showing the commitment of the uh, society into innovation. Um, I would love to introduce my co-chair, Hunaid, who has been appointed uh, as the chair of the innovation committee that you might have heard about from the earlier presentation, trying to integrate the society. We are, um, we've got a, a very exciting three presentations um, uh, late uh, today. And Hunaid, uh, please, uh, uh, take over. Okay, thank you, thank you, Hazim. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll keep it short so that you know it's that time of the day when we don't want to spend too much time. So I'd, I'm delighted to introduce Franco Chuli, who is my colleague at um, Bristol, uh, and he's been actively involved in very successful innovation for the last many years at Bristol. He is a senior surgeon at uh, Bristol and he is going to tell us about his experience, his current um, interests, and the future of innovation in adult cardiac surgery. Over to you, Franco. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, it is with great pleasure and enthusiasm that I accepted the task of addressing the society today on the topic of cardiac surgeon as an innovator. In preparing this talk, I realized how much has changed during the time that I was a student, an apprentice, and now as a consultant. I'm going to give you a personal account of how I have seen innovation over the years and what our prospects as surgeons are for the future. In 1962, Kennedy motivated a nation and inspired the world. Seven years later, Neil Armstrong was walking on the moon. From the developments that ensued, enabling man to reach the moon, we still benefit today. Robotics, satellite communication, miniaturization of computers such that our mobile devices have now more computing power than any spacecraft of the 60s. Looking back at Earth, man must have realized the vastness of the universe that our planet is immersed in and how potentially fragile our environment could be. Innovation requires teamwork. Those who work in isolation rarely make demonstrable and important discoveries. Fresh new ideas must be generated from specialist studies, background work, and the courage to think outside the box. While the implementation phase must be planned meticulously with clear thought and particular attention focused on risk assessment, marketing comes last. One, uh, uh, once the idea has been implemented, audited, and considered safe. To err is human, but to persist is diabolical. I cannot overlook a significant part of uh, the UK cardiac history uh, without mentioning the Peacock Club, so beautifully depicted in Tom Treasure's publication, and Donald Ross, whose operation still carries his name. Who in their right mind could think of such a procedure? Yet it has stood the test of time and is still an option for younger patients wishing to remain free of the burden of anticoagulation. As a child, I guess I was influenced by media attention around the first heart transplant by Christian Barnard in 67. He had just finished working for Norman Shumway at the Stanford Laboratories and on his return to South Africa, performed the first human to human heart transplant. This took courage to say the least and a touch of bloody mindedness but also the skill to put together a team who could support him. He may, have tickled, he may have ticked all the boxes on the innovation front, but also ticked Norman Shumway off considerably. Any form of in innovation will encounter resistance from many angles. And then there is the distinct prospect of failure. A learning curve in those days was acceptable as there were no other alternatives, but today it is not. I had the privilege of working at Papworth in the early 90s. I was surrounded by surgeons who were part of the grand development of heart and lung transplantation with a worldwide reputation. 
Sir Terence English performed the first successful heart transplant in the UK in 1997. I had just started university at that stage, with, but with a distinct ambition to specialize in cardiac surgery. In 1991, I joined the transplant team and what an experience it was. John Warwick had performed the first heart-lung transplant in 94, uh, having himself uh, spent a fellowship at Stanford. He had the know-how, the courage, and the organizational skills to go on to perform the first triple organ transplant for which he is mentioned with Sir Roy Khan in the Guinness Book of Records. Not many cardiac surgeons in there. It takes a special leadership skill to implement this level of organization. And the unit had the best results for heart, transplant, for heart and lung transplantation in the world by 20%. I was one of the first registrars to be taken through three heart lung transplants before I left. Thank you, John and the team. Again, the same theme of, of teamwork uh, was very prominent in the transplant center. Without a team structure, the support of the program, the surgeon would only be a mere technician performing a, an operation. Instead, from the transplant physicians, microbiologists, pathologists, nursing staff, intensivists and junior, and even Polly who organized the full English breakfast for the teams who had been up all night, everyone had an important um, role to play and they were valued in the team. Everyone wanted to fulfill their role to the best of their ability. In 1994, I spent a sabbatical year at the transplant center at St. Vincent's Hospital in Sydney, my hometown. I consolidated my knowledge, consolidated my operating skill and observed a slightly different system, but no less efficient. Victor Chang had been shot um, on his way to work in 1991. Phil Spratt had taken over as head of transplantation. Here I learned how important marketing and the media can be. Chang was a household name in Australia and still is, as was Fiona Coote, um, the longest living heart transplant recipient in the Southern Hemisphere. She is still alive and has done more for the reputation of St. Vincent's and of transplantation and organ donation than the whole of the team put together. While I was there, St. Vincent's introduced the LVAD HeartMate device, mainly as a bridge to transplant. Patients having less than weeks to live would be put on the device, which was tethered by a drive line, but fully implanted. We could then take the patients out for lunch to a fish and chip shop close by, and we'd book the table close to the power socket so it was possible to plug in the console before the battery ran out. On my return to the UK, I was exposed to more conventional cardiac surgery. And by the time I was a consultant, Cosgrove was organizing a teleconference, which I attended uh, at Southampton. It was under the first of its kind, and we had full view of the live proceedings. The learning was great, and after a short stay at Cleveland Clinic, I introduced this technique to the Northern General Hospital, where I was working at the time. The operations went well, but my inexperience in developing a true team with more than one surgeon put too much pressure on me, and so I felt the need to stop. The aim of any minimally invasive operation is to avoid a stenotomy. This approach goes through an intercostal space, avoiding rib fractures and is muscle sparing. Industry has played its role with innovating instruments and introducing mini mitrals to many, many surgeons. Frederick Moore devised a loop technique of Gore-Tex to help minimize the aortic cross clamp times particularly in the more complex cases. This is a familiar view to the mini mitral surgeons. It is a great view of the mitral valve and is a great teaching aid. The Leipzig group have published a repair rate of 87% using this technique with a 0.3% conversion rate, a 30 day mortality of 2.4%. It is a safe and effective procedure, but look at what is happening. In the meantime, Schaff and colleagues 
in the Mayo Clinic um, have le uh, laid down the gauntlet for percutaneous interventions. Number two, expanded use of minimally invasive mitral valve surgery. One in 10 individuals over the age of 75 will suffer from mitral valve regurgitation, also known as mitral regurgitation or MR. It is a condition where blood leaks backward through the opening of the mitral valve into the left atrium, placing extra burden on the heart and lungs. The diagnosis also brings worry of major surgery and months of recovery. While the situation is unnerving, Minimally invasive surgery for mitral valve repair was introduced in 2013. But until now, the innovative transcatheter device for repair was only approved to treat mitral valve regurgitation in individuals with primary MR who were not eligible for open heart surgery. In March, the FDA broadened its approval of the device to include patients with secondary MR, MR as a result of an enlarged left ventricle, the newly expanded use targets patients who have failed to get symptom relief from other therapies. This expanded use of the minimally invasive method is bringing relief to more patients by removing some of the risk, fear, and inconvenience associated with cardiac surgery. So the definition of minimally invasive mitral valve surgery is already being blurred in the eyes of the patients, and we need to react to this. Is degenerative mitral valve pathology the last surgical stronghold? Hopefully, the UK mini mitral trial will give some strong evidence and set the standards. However, techniques which are catheter based, such as mitral clip and tendine, are no longer just around the corner. I'm one of the mitral clip operators in the UK. In Bristol, I have share the responsibility of the operating sessions with my cardiology structural heart colleague. It is a true heart team approach from MDT intervention and follow-up. The advantages are tangible in a healthy professional collaboration, which benefits each and every patient. As a surgeon, I can intervene as necessary, which in over 80 cases has happened only once. We operate in a hybrid operating theater. There is a team of echo cardiographers who participate regularly and include cardiologists and anesthetists. We are seeing a distinct paradigm shift in the realms of aortic surgery as well. The aortic valve is now crossed and replaced by a TAVI. Redo AVRs are nearly a thing of the past with valve and valve procedures. There is transapical, uh, subclavian approaches or direct aortic valve TAVI. Clinical, clinical trials show that low risk TAVI and extremely high risk salvation situations are possible. The, DS, the ACE in the aortic aneurysm pairs transapical aortic and transapical uh, repair of aortic dissections are just around the corner. This is Char Rajakaruna, my colleague, who is implanting the first branched frozen elephant trunk in the UK. Major surgery, major pathology, made easier by innovation from industry and co collaboration with um, clinicians. I want to talk to you for two minutes about off-pump coronary artery bypass surgery, which I've been doing since 1998. In those days, an assistant would hold a Satinsky clamp partially open parallel to the LAD as a stabilizing device. Only the LAD and diagonal branches could be done in this way. When I arrived in Bristol, Professor Angelini had already perfected a better setup using a compressor stabilizer. An intracoronary shunt, a CO2 blower, and eventually industry made stabilizers making the technical aspects of sewing much easier. Finally, a pericardial stitch between the IVC and the left inferior pulmonary vein completed the setup and I was then able to perform 99% of coronary artery bypass operations off pump. So where do we go from here? What does the future hold for the cardiac surgeon? Our next projects 
our neocord, triclip, and tendine as far as the mitral valve uh, is concerned. These are all established techniques elsewhere. Um, most of these now have um, CE approval, and we will be starting our own uh, programs very shortly. We have already started a hybrid loan AF uh, approach, um, and uh, we hope to be tackling the ascending aorta in the not too distant future. I say to my colleagues who do endovascular work that from the ascending aorta, it is only a very small push to get through the aortic valve. Retirement, maybe in the future, but it's all too exciting at the moment. I was two years old when Kennedy indicated that there was public funding to go to the moon. Cardiac surgery was, becoming, was beginning to flourish. And by the time I was 10, the effects of innovation up to that stage had inspired me to become a cardiac surgeon. I was inspired by the science rather than just the humanitarian aspects of surgery. We have a responsibility as a specialty to carry on the work of the pioneers. We stand on their shoulders. We are inspired by their hard work and achievements, and we have the skills to reach higher still. Let's make mantra, why should we exist? If we stand still, our skills and knowledge will eventually be lost. As surgeons, we have the knowledge, the skills, the know-how to work our way around the heart and to fix it. The reason for improvement should always focus on the benefit for the patients. If we acquire endovascular and wire skills, we explode into a new era of meaningful innovation where we can offer all options to the patients without invested interests. Any improvement needs to be demonstrable and reproducible for a broad spectrum of surgeons. If you cannot teach the next generation, your innovation is self-limiting. Time is the biggest examiner and the evolution of what we do today will be traced back to us in the years to come. Thank you. Thank you for your truly, truly outstanding presentation and your summary of uh, your previous experience and the future prospects. Um, are we going to take questions at the end, Hazim? Yes, I think uh, I would encourage everyone to put some questions on Slido and we try to address them at the end. Uh, our uh, faculty are hopefully staying with us to answer them. Uh, and we just move on to uh, from an amazing uh, uh, demonstration of the evolution in uh, and in in cardiac surgery to with our next speaker, if it, uh, the innovation in thoracic surgery. Joel Dunning is um, no stranger to a lot of people, and he doesn't need much of uh, uh, introduction. But looking at his career from earlier on. I'm just going to mention words, best bets, Cal's course. Uh, he taught me how to do vat application as a mentor uh, coming from another hospital, microlobectomy, subzifoid th thymectomy, and then moves on to the robotics, uh, a lively YouTube channel, wristed instruments, and many, many more. And he's one of the early ones who decided electric cars are the way forward. I followed suit. Our, the Elon Musk of thoracic surgery, I call him. Um, Joel, it's nice to have you again. Hello, Hello, and welcome to this session where I'm going to talk to you about innovation in thoracic surgery. It's been a pretty bad year. We've had a little bit of a virus. We've had all sorts of disruptions. But think positively. The world is a better place. It's getting better. Uh, health is getting better. Uh, we're curing diseases. Polio is history. We're getting taller. Uh, we're getting richer. And, uh, and we've got more leisure time. The only bad thing is people are stopping smoking. As a surgeon, I don't like that too much. But that is good for the world. So things are getting better. In thoracic surgery, take a step back. Only 12 years ago or so, this was the standard approach, thoracotomies for, for lung cancer. We changed uh, wholeheartedly to uh, VATS, lobectomy, 
three-port approach. Diego taught us how to do uniportal approach. Of note, we smashed the copybook with Uniportal, where instead of looking at papers of benefit, we used YouTube and social media and uh, interaction to change the world uh, to Uniportal. Uh, so that was massively innovative. Um, many of us have been to Shanghai and seen people going further than Uniportal, going to sub ziphoid Uniportal, going to all sorts of other approaches. The cervical approach, Marin Zielinski can get a lobe out through the neck. Innovation is crazy common uh, in thoracics. People using hybrid approaches. This is a sub ziphoid port in robotic surgery. We use this routinely now, uh, which is of massive benefits. We have novel instrumentation in thoracic surgery. We have got wristed instruments. Some people used to call VATS lobectomy straight stick surgery, but no more. So this is the flex dex uh, wristed instrument, but actually we've also, and, and you can combine this uh, also with, uh, this is the freehand surgical uh, camera holder, which is completely free and costs a hundred quid uh, per new drape on it. Uh, so you can actually innovate, try new things uh, and even create your own robot by the bedside really. So wristed instruments, uh, robotic camera holders, surgeon powered robot. Um, we've got these new instruments, artist sentinel wristed instruments. They're actually easier than those flex decks instruments because you can have one in either hand. Uh, the really great thing about innovation in thoracic surgery is you can just try this. If you get these, you can have a go in a thymectomy, lobectomy, all sorts of things. And, and actually these will uh, look like uh, robotic surgery. You can get round vessels with them. You can do all sorts of things. I wish somebody in cardiac surgery uh, would approach me and say, let's try this in a port access mitral. I just think it would be so good for, um, for uh, stitching in there. But let's move on to some more interesting topics in thoracic surgery. We are turning into a robotic specialty and the robots are coming fast. Uh, so look out for Hugo uh, by Medtronic. They used to call it Einstein for some crazy reason. They changed the name to Hugo. But there we go. It's going to be four different modules all coming to the bedside. It's going to be exciting. Um, the exciting thing is actually going to be the fact that you can use all the Medtronic instruments. So your own favorite Covidian staplers, energy, they'll all be on that. And also they're going to package it all up. So they're going to come to your hospital and say, if you use all Medtronic instruments, then we'll give you free robots. So that's going to be exciting. Probably here next year. Oh, and they also do Medtronic robotic socks. So you don't have to take your shoes off and put your nasty sticky feet on their pedals. Um, they've been saying since about 2018, they're going to come to market the latest is maybe next year but they have said that for four years but so we'll wait and see um verb surgical uh, the johnson and johnson serving again has been for years saying uh, we're coming we're coming i went and visited them a couple of years ago and i've been on the phone to them uh, just last month and had a conference call with them again they're probably about a year away but again because they're johnson and johnson they'll be packaging everything up in your hospital saying if you do uh, unique contracts with us will give you free robots, I bet. So watch that space. Um, this is another uh, thing that I think is super exciting. Again, I've just been on some conference calls with Daniel O, Catherine Moore uh, and Mariam Curette uh, in Intuitive, and they are just getting FDA approval for single port robotics in thoracic surgery. Uh, I flew over two years ago to do a robotic single port sub ziphoid lobectomy and thymectomy and in a cadaver, and it's phenomenal. This will be the future of robotic surgery, sub ziphoid uniportal robotic. It'll be thymectomy first, and then as people get confidence with that, we will then go into lobectomy. Phenomenal, phenomenally expensive, but there we go. Well, what about robots, the here and the now? So the here and the now is our beautiful British robot, Cambridge Medical Robotics, uh, a startup company started by Mark Slack, a gynecology surgeon. He's the CMO. Uh, and, uh, and here in Cambridge, uh, this is it, us doing cadaveric studies on it. They've got uh, modular uh, robotics, a uh, uh, very different way of holding uh, a robotic uh, instrument instead of intuitive that hold it like a pen, uh, they hold it like a lance. Um, 
other really cool things. They freed up your two important fingers so that you can use your thumb on a joystick. So it's like a, a Xbox uh, controller split in two. And the really good thing about that is that that means you can stand up. They're actually designing a drape to go on the Surgeon console. So basically, if you imagine my arms there on a sterile drape, uh, and I'm double gloved, I can instantly come to the table, take one double glove off, maybe do a firing or help out or be there for safety, then straight back to the console. Uh, so I'll be much closer to the patient uh, with Cambridge Medical Robotics. Also just notice that the assistant uh, has a lot more space and is not gonna get crushed uh, by this fantastic new robot. Obviously a nice open screen rather than head down a box, uh, which might be nice. But that's not the exciting thing about uh, Cambridge Medical Robotics. The exciting thing is what we're doing uh, with it. So this is in my room uh, right now. We did uh, our very first telemented live robotic thoracic surgical case. Uh, this was me mentoring Sven Seifert in Chemnitz in East Germany, uh, doing the very first robotic case. It was a wedge and lymphadenectomy. We've also now done a thymectomy and we're planning a first lobectomy next week. Um, you can see in very sort of distant there, there is uh, the patient uh, and it looks really nice. The, the assistant's not been crushed. There's the arms. And uh, I guess for surgical innovation, the real message here is uh, remote telementoring. It might be the future, but boy, is it scary. Um, here I am, uh, I've got connection to the surgeon. I can see his arm movement, but there were some Wi-Fi problems. There were some chatting to the surgeon problems. And boy, when they've got a bit of blood on the screen uh, and the Wi-Fi is going down and uh, it really is uh, pretty scary. So if, if anyone's thinking of getting into remote telementoring, we really need to make sure that technology works well for us. But that is our future and it's going to be an exciting future. Intuitive are going to put it standardly on their robot. Cambridge Medical Robotics are going to have it standard on their systems. Uh, so we're going to talk a bit more about uh, novel technology uh, computationally, but a few little tiny things um, for the surgeons out there. This is the 12 mil uh, standard Covidian tri stapler. Uh, we're using it on our robotic platform here on our fourth generation XI. But we were just comparing a few different staplers uh, the intuitive offering is the Shaw Form 45, the second generation of their stapler, which has a, a uh, hook on it. It's not too bad, but see for that vessel at the top there, it's still twice the size of that vessel, which I still hate. Intuitive aren't going anywhere near a smaller staple, but here is the new Covidian smaller stapler. Look at that, smaller than the vessel, super maneuverable. What a beauty, 50 degrees articulation. It's a gem. Get this in your hospital hospital right now. Beautiful uh, for much smaller stapling for smaller vessels and basically anything smaller than that just use energy on it because we've just done the PAA's trial that shows you can staple uh, smaller vessels. We are now routinely uh, sending people down to the CT scanner, injecting with 0.2 mils of ICG and this is what you see. It's phenomenal. Um, it, it, it stays for three hours. Any skeptics that think it doesn't stay for three hours are just wrong. So you can label where your nodule is. Uh, you can then uh, isolate where it is. You can do your segmentectomy. You can then do ICG IV and you know where your segmental plane is. Uh, we're now doing this loads. Every thoracic surgeon in the country must have a way of identifying nodules that you cannot see and that you cannot feel. We're entering a new era of small nodules. You must be able to do this. We've just bought the new uh, Stort Spy system, which has a fluorescent camera in it. So we can do this by VATS as well. Um, but it is not acceptable in the modern era to not have a labeling technique in your hospital in thoracic surgery these days. Now for the last five minutes, let's talk about proper exciting tough. Stuff. So this is called View 6. Uh, this is a Medtronic version of something else you may have heard of called Rods and Cones, which is the old new Google Glass. We are now doing uh, medical student uh, experiences with this. I have this on my uh, face. Uh, I've got a whole basically laptop screen in there. They can text me with uh, questions. Uh, they're in my ear. I can hear them. They can hear us and they can have a day in our hospital without turning up. That's great. Um, we're in the new mastery trial. The mastery trial records every single hand movement I do. Uh, and we're collecting 500 patients. Uh, and what we're gonna do basically is metric 
uh, every case. We're going to uh, do a qu quality of life questionnaire, pre-op, 30 days, 90 days, and we're going to work out what makes a great operation. So no more will you have to do 20 cases, and after 20 cases, you're a competent surgeon. We're going to work out the metrics that make you as good as an average surgeon. I'm certainly very average. This is going to be an amazing new future. But the amazing new future is this. There are three companies all looking how to collect all your hand movement data in robotics or VATS or whatever. CSATs, Orpheus, which is the intuitive version and touch surgery. Um, they're all spending billions and millions on this. So if we talk about the CSATs version, uh, which uh, we're hoping to be the first in the UK to use this, um, they already have 30,000 cases on their system. It's any, anybody can use it. So actually they're all intuitive robotic cases or VATS cases. They record your videos, they put them up in the cloud, but they automatically segment them. Uh, so you can do the lymph node harvest, isolated, all that. It tells you how long you've taken. But the exciting thing is that it scores you. Now, how do they score you? Well, at the moment, they're crowdsource scoring you. 18-year-olds out there have been taught to mark you in bimanual dexterity, depth perception, efficiency, sensitivity, and give you a score. So this person just got 20 out of 25 scoring for their operation. Obviously, they're going to train artificial intelligence to start doing this, but initially they're using crowdsourcing. Genius. Also, you can send the videos to experts who will then tell you what they think of it. And the AI will then look through the comments and tell you how many were good comments and how many were bad comments. And it will list all that. You can do scores for how well you're doing. There's a massive, huge plethora of other people's videos. So you can look through, so you can look through the exact operation you're about to do. Phenomenal. This is the future of thoracic surgery. Uh, and imagine going for a job where you have got scores of 20 out of 25 for all your lobectomies. Anyway, just in the last few minutes, here's a few new things we're doing. Uh, we're looking in multimodal local anesthesia. We're putting all these different types of anesthetic, bupivacaine, dexamethasone, magnesium, clondine, ketamine, um, all sorts of things into our local anesthetic. But how do, how do we know if they work? This is the answer. You may have heard of a BIS probe. This brand new monitor fits on your finger when you're under general anaesthetic and it spikes when you're in pain. It really works. I've put this in patients. Uh, I've done everything I thought I could do. And then you lift the bronchus and there's a spike in pain. So when you lift it, that's the bit we can't give anaesthesia to. So I'm now doing mediastinal anaesthetic, squirting local at the start of a case into where the subcranial station is. And that spike disappeared. This is game changing, telling you where to put your local anaesthetic. Phenomenal. Have an open mind into all modes of local anaesthetic, of all, all analgesia. We have just appointed Robin Sunley to do acupuncture 15 hours a week in our unit. Um, it has been transformational. We pre-op, post-op, thoracotomies, all sorts. It's absolutely brilliant. Um, we have also just got funding. Johnny Ferguson got funding. We have four advanced nurse practitioners on our ward. We got funding successfully from, from Macmillan to say, right, one of those nurses, we're putting you in a car and the day of discharge of a lobectomy, you're going to go and see that person at home, uh, day one post discharge. Uh, and what does that do? That makes us to send people home an average of a day earlier. This is saving a day per patient. Uh, and also they're going out, also they're going through the histology afterwards. They're telling the people if they've got N1, N2 disease, they're telling them if they've got mesothelioma, that's stopping them having to come back to clinic uh, in, in the COVID era. This is transformational. I strongly encourage you to look into getting your nurses in cars to see patients at home. You're, it will instantly pay for itself uh, by, by the days saved in hospital. What else have we done in lockdown? Well, Goa Health is an amazing app that we've created. We've got over 20 different videos specifically for our patients. So this is us narrating to our patients what they're going to expect. Having lung cancer in our unit, what's amebiosinoscopy, what's VATS, robotics, complications, add family and friends, all sorts of 
uh, PDFs and things, even directions to the hospital. This is sent to every single patient preoperatively uh, and it's bespoke to our hospital. But the really great thing is that postoperatively, uh, we've got an amazing part. So postoperative pain management, nausea and constipation, dressings, they can send photos of their wounds to us afterwards and we're in daily contact with them. <clears throat> but that's not the coolest thing about this. The coolest thing, sorry, and the coolest thing about this is that we have a pain and med medications questionnaire. Every day they fill in how much pain they're having, what medications they're taking. So if we see a spike in their pain, we phone them up and we tell them to take more medications or put it down. And then for five years, it's going to send them a questionnaire asking them if they've got any alarm bell cancer symptoms. We're going to do online cancer symptom tracking for five years for our patients. And it takes no effort. And what's more, this is for normally cheap. Uh, to use. It's, it's just run by two people in New Zealand called Susan and Alan Binks. It's phenomenal. So my time's up. Um, we've also set up a massive nursing e-learning course, 40 different modules, everything you see here, analgesia, blood gases, chest strain, everything, because uh, online learning is the future. Go to csuals.org if you want to see this, but mine time's up. Thank you very much for listening. That is truly inspiring, uh, Joel. Um, I think he need, he need with us to introduce the last speaker. Yeah, I'd, uh, I'd love to introduce Rafael, who I've known only for a few weeks uh, as part of the member of the Innovations Committee. Uh, Rafael is a congenital cardiac surgeon at Older Hay Liverpool Hospital. He's been the chief there, he's been the clinical director there, and he's also the director of innovation. So over to you, Rafael, to talk about the innovation in congenital cardiac surgery. Hey, good morning, everybody. Um, thanks to the, <clears throat> to the committee for inviting me to present about innovation. I think that I'm very excited to share my experience over the last few years on how to develop innovation. And today I'm going to share with you a snapshot of what I've been doing over the last years about healthcare innovation and applied technology. Um, creativity is about connecting dots as the great innovator who was Steve Jobs was uh, mentioning in his biography. And innovation is all about changing this, challenging the status quo. And that's what uh, made me the, the beginning of innovation a few years ago was when I was trying to uh, challenging exactly what was going on. So we always have taking blood samples in intensive care unit and a baby, you take about 10 samples a day and, and, and that's phenomenal amount of samples to measure all the blood, uh, blood biochemistry. And I thought, well, can we do it in a different way? And I came with the idea to do, can we use transdermal sensors? So I start to investigate that and essentially just um, challenging what was happening and thinking what was unthinkable or undoable. And I mean, anyway, we managed to get a, a grant over a million pounds in grant to develop transdermal sensor to measure lactate, to measure HV, etc. Um, and today we are going to talk about innovation in congenital cardiac surgery and developing an innovation cultures and obviously creating an innovation center. I would love to talk forever about congenital cardiac surgery, but it's important to share the rest of this experience with you. When we think about it, we all have gone through uh, the training in congenital, and in congenital cardiac, every day is a different case, every day the anatomy is different, and it's so important to visualize exactly what we're doing, to analyze anatomy, to be able to plan your operation and to have a good outcome at the end. Um, so, Traditionally, you do x-rays, angiograms, CT scan, MRI, and again, I thought, well, we've been doing that for 20 or 30 years. Can we do something different? Um, so can we, and I start to investigate the possibilities of doing a 3D printing and to doing, yeah, finally, immersive technology. If we think about it, these are the pictures that we get into a, a CT scan reconstruction, and we show you the anatomy of the aortic arts or the pulmonary arteries, and you have a better idea about what to do for the case. But still, a two 
two-dimensional screen view because it's still in a two-dimensional view in your screen, in any type of screen. And, and clearly the, the, the operations and the babies on the hearts for any case are not two-dimensional, they are three-dimensional. So we started, uh, this is the first case that we do to, uh, a 3D printing of a TAPBD case in a two days old baby for the purpose of <clears throat> improving the visibility and, and the planning of the operation. It's not that we are going to change the operation, but it helped us to explain the parents in that way. And that was the first model, the same size of the patient, in which replicate very clearly how it's similar of an infracardiac TPPD going to the liver and in the same way in the 3D printing. And we advanced from there. So we have the first embedded uh, 3D printing company inside our hospital. And that was with a, uh, it's a long story, but uh, we we create this terrific group with Innovation Center and with this company, 3D Life Print, and in which we, they were coming to the MDT and we were doing the segmentations together and we spent a lot of time, but it helped us to choose the right cut, the right thing that we needed to do. So it was just not just doing the 3D printing, but being involved segmentation, bringing the engineers to the MDT and making decisions about what to do. And these are some of the examples. So we use it for education, training, communication, like for complex cases or truncos, unusual cases like rupture of sinus of valsalva in a, in a baby, or decision-making, which is one of the main uses, like when you want to do intracardiac routines or double switches. Um, we do it with a transparent material that we can see inside and trying to travel and design the type of patch or hot patch we need to do in order to do the rerouting inside. So pretty useful for all these things. In HCSD patients, we have this complex case with our colleagues from Liverpool Heart and Chest and together with the Arctic team, we, we print the, the, um, the chest wall, we print the heart, we print the lungs to find out where was the best access for these patients who have a complete rotated uh, nearly 360 degrees of the heart and the aorta and needed an aortic root replacement. Um, very successful operation at the end and we're terrifically, uh, very happy with the planning that we need to do using 3D printing. We use it for uh, simulation and training. And then you can see this one of our niche. We, we print a technology of Fallot and he's doing the transcellular patch. Um, so we print the lungs, the ribs, and they can have the same sensation. And that's a few years ago. And this now is being adopted in a few places in the States, in Canada, is where they're doing courses using 3D printing for that purpose. But 3D printing is not just that. Is we need to think about in, in congenital, not just in congenital, but probably in every area of medicine. You want to visualize things, and the mental imagery is is a fact. So you, whenever you want to do an operation, is probably do you go and imagine in your head how you are going to do the operation, and that's when we start to move into immersive technology. And immersive technology is essentially virtual reality and augmented reality. And at the time we start with virtual reality, and this is a kid with a six months old with the trilogy. And we are all holoportating or teleportating ourselves and traveling inside the heart to visualize the anatomy. And this was just to see if this is possible or not, how we uh, uh, capture all the data and taking it and to transmit into virtual reality. Uh, and this is you can able to come from inside from the as you know, from the aortic root, you go down into the aorta and you can see the overriding of the septum, which is the typical in tetralogy of fallot. So useful uh, in some cases um, and to be able, just to be able that you, you can do that. Um, the next step is augmented reality. And we've been chosen by Microsoft uh, uh, with this HoloLens, which is a product, uh, which is a headset, which is augmented reality, which is different from virtual reality. In augmented reality, for you, you have a complete view of around your uh, your surroundings. In addition of that, you will have, as you can see, some holograms floating in front of you to be able to manipulate. And we've been working in a collaboration and partnership with Microsoft to develop this and apply this to in healthcare. And it's been uh, phenomenally successful. And, uh, and we have found several areas in which we can use this. I'm going to share with you briefly some of them. So here we are in the, car, in the operating room, and this is a view in which uh, obviously you cannot see that, but that's the view that I will see from the, uh, with, the, um, uh, with the headset, and which is a hologram floating and showing me the anatomy. And then I'm trying to overlay the anatomy on top of the heart to make a decision where I'm going to do the cut or so. This is just obviously the beginning, and, and probably this will get improved. In advanced visualization, 
is to be able to see the um, the heart how it's moving again in front of you and to visualize, all right, I need to cut here, I need to do that. So it shouldn't be just cardiac, pediatric cardiac surgery, but uh, other things. Um, with COVID, there was a, a massive acceleration in the deployment of this technology, and we use it quite a lot in older hay to reduce the, the, um, the contact of patient contact, uh, being able to uh, reduce the use of PPA. And in, in some cases, you can have access to the patient um, from home. So a patient in an ECMO, they are going on an echocardiogram that they need my advice, and I am answering from my phone exactly. I can see what the the, the cardiologist is doing the echocardiogram, and this is just a, a just a recorded, so it's not a specific, you know, with not recording a very specific technique. And I ask me, please show me the monitor. He's able to show me monitor. So essentially, I'm transporting myself into the uh, intensive care unit and making decision. And it's not only me; they can connect several people at the same time. And obviously, is there is no geography. You can be connected from anywhere in the world if you need to do that. Um, surgery was the same. So we have this case with with uh, in which, uh, uh, in this case, in which we have baby with transposition of COVID and which we operated. Um, not many people could come into theater, and we found some abnormal findings during the operation. And we just needed to share this with the rest of the team. Um, and essentially, probably just to, to uh, make aware of the cardiologist that they got the diagnosis wrong. Uh, and, and this is the view that they can see from outside. So this is our colleagues um, from home, and they can see exactly what I can see. And they are showing them uh, the different part of the anatomy and making uh, decisions about that. So it's, it's the, the applications are many of them. They can be used in education and training, and we are working with the University of Liverpool and Imperial College is phenomenally advanced in doing this with their students, in which you can have uh, areas of simulation, teaching um, for the area. So the potential to expand into any of our cardiac, adult cardiac, especially thoracic surgery for teaching, training, holograms is phenomenal, I think. Um, this is just two examples or three examples between the sensor, the 3D printing, which you just have to uh, come with ideas of how can you uh, challenge what is going on and just say that everything is possible. But you need to develop a culture of innovation. And the base of what we developed in congenital was the, the probably the foundation to develop a, a center of innovation in older high children hostel, which is an award-winning innovation center in one of the largest in the, in the world, probably. Um, we replicated what they were doing in Boston Children and trying to improve, but we develop a culture of innovation, which is essential, not just should be in cardio, but should be for everybody. And we, in 2015, we had the first hackathon in the UK with MIT from America. And this is an example of problem solution. So this is a clutter of lines and everything around the babies. And you probably seen adults the same. And we say, how can we declutter and make this more organized? And we come with different ideas. We were not the winners. They were, the nurses came with a, a fantastic idea of how to put sensors in the dressings of the IV lines and, where they, and that change color when there is extravasation of, of fluid. We continue with the next year, we did a festival of innovation. But in that case, what we did is we involved parents, we involved the kids, and they came with idea, they were involved. It was terrific. And we developed a rapid prototyping center for that. Um, and now we have a huge, a, a very big older hay innovation center. And the main columns in which we work is an area of immersive technology, augmented reality, sensors and wearables, and rapid prototyping. Uh, you, you have now a, 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 a partnership with Philips to develop a new neonatal intensive care unit. And then we have the rapid prototyping in which the, the team was doing tremendous job developing different type of masks during the pandemic. Um, which they have made prototype for this, and they've been used in, in many, many places. Um, then we have the immersive lab in the specific area to, to practice, so people who can want to use immersive technology, augmented reality, virtual reality, and they can teach and train other people. And, uh, and the brand new uh, uh, artificial intelligence headquarters. Um, this is with IBM and with uh, Microsoft as well and to be developed, uh, which is developing well. And I just been in a meeting this morning in which uh, we are going to put uh, collect all the data from ITU 
and different areas to put it together and come. And this will help us to, you know, Im improve treatments and, and probably in, hopefully improve outcomes and mainly planning operations as well, uh, or, or planning the, the health system in the future. This has been a long journey of innovation. So I'm, I'm so excited that the society have embraced to develop innovation because innovation shouldn't be just pr producing new type of operation. It has to be more than that and has to be agnostic. We will probably work together with the guys in thoracic and chiral cardiac to bring together everybody's ideas so that in, in, instead of working in silos, we all rep, uh, uh, we work together. And, and that's the way more or less how we've done it. And now we have a, 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 a good innovation place, a lot of people working in it. It, it has to be working as a team and, and you just kind of give the vision of how you, you think that things go in the right way and just challenge and just challenge everything that uh, you think that is impossible is absolutely possible to do it. Uh, so I'm, I'm very excited with, with the society doing that. And I'm, uh, um, and I think that the, um, the, the teams with cardi adult cardiac, thoracic transplantation and congenital, we will probably will be exchanging ideas and, and to do this. Uh, thank you very much. And I hope that you enjoyed this presentation and the uh, Thank you. Are we alive? I think. Um, yeah. Can you hear us? Yes. Well, that was uh, absolutely phenomenal. It's a shame you couldn't be with us uh, to answer some of the questions. Um, uh, we are very, we're running um, late with our presentations as ever, but there are some, uh, lots of comments. Um, commending the speakers obviously coming through uh, but um, there's one question I think I'd mirror uh, Mr. David Jenkins uh, from Papworth is balancing the governance that has been becoming obviously much more stringent compared to the 90s and he wonders about what the pace is going to look like we, we feel that innovation all around us is at astronomical speed but yet, uh, from our phone to our cars, all, all the rest of that. But in terms of uh, healthcare, um, with more scrutiny, are we likely to be much faster or slower compared to the 90s? I think Franco, you've touched on in your in your in your talk on uh, on the importance of safety. Um, if I would hear your opinion on that, and possibly. Uh, Joel after that yes I totally agree it, it's not like it was in the 70s 80s and 90s uh, the learning curve is nearly unacceptable uh, these days and there are various committees that you have to go through within the hospital um, new procedures clinical governance and so on so I think we foremost have to protect the patients from uh, possible problems but we also have to be at the forefront of innovation and um, safety has to be our prime concern otherwise it's no point uh joel have you got any views on on how do we to maintain innovation at the forefront without uh, affecting the pace of it i think He's driving, I think. <laughs> His car is probably driving for him. For him, yeah. yeah. Can I ask a question? Unless there's another question from the public. Yeah, okay. yeah please go ahead, Hunaid. No, I just wanted to ask Franco and Joel and Rafael. You see, there's a lot of hostility around new procedures, a lot of apprehension. I mean, one is going through the different procedures to get a new procedure up and running. One is to reduce apprehension within our colleagues and our members of staff and different specialties. How, in your experience, you, you guys are much more experienced and you've been through this in the past. How do you allay that? How do you allay the anxiety? What are the different things that you would recommend that more junior surgeons should do? 
Joel, Joel seems to have disappeared again. So shall I go first on that one? Yeah, yeah. Um, please. So I think teamwork is the first thing. So you have to have a team of people that you take with you and that have, have made that idea, your idea, theirs as well, and that they participate in it fully. Um, as I said, you can't be a lone um, uh, operator because then the hostility all focuses on you. And that is maybe where we have failed in the past and, and these are lessons learned. Um, and also um, making sure that the technology is there, that the setup is there, and that the <laughs> Terence English used to say to me, the first three cases have to be perfect. I think that these days, the first 30 cases have to be perfect. Um, and there's no doubt that uh, the proof is in the pudding and that people will start um, coming onto your side. Tech innovation and change will always be um, something that people fear and therefore you, you have to be very, very careful uh, at the start of the program, whatever you're doing. I think, Hazir, if there are no further questions, we sh need to stop here. There's just a quick, uh, interesting question from Rizwan Kureshian, and I think um, uh, he's asking about funding for uh, R&D innovation. Um, I could potentially direct you into different sorts of funding. There is a, a structure within within uh, every trust, uh, and that you would you would go to via your uh it depends on what level you're looking at if you, if you have a new technology from start with exploitation towards the, taking new procedures and so on the, but yes the answer to that the short answer is very uh well structured um not always friendly to navigate but there is one um joel um, questions about cars and 4Gs, I, I think we can do that off, from Aman offline. Yeah. Um, uh, I, know, I think close the session, Hazim. I Bye. think we're running. Thank you. Thank, you, thank you very much for a very uh, uh, exciting talk. Can I say I, I'd like to thank all the three speakers, Franco, Joel and Rafael, who are truly pioneers in the field and have delivered some outstanding messages today and for the participants on being part of the session. Thank you very much and speak to you soon. Enjoy the rest.